know that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy Hello and welcome to the Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser known aspect of our local history. Joining me today on the program is Elena Martinez. Hey, Elena. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, Elena is a veteran sketch performer around Seattle. She performs with many groups, including Sober Virgin, which performs at the Pocket Theater regularly. She is part of the Two Women group Lipstick, along with Rachel Walls, and she also performs with the ensemble Getting Naked with Friends. She's also a stand-up comedian, an improviser. You'd have a harder time not seeing her perform than seeing her perform, really. Anything I'm leaving out? Um, no, not that I can... You did a good job. You okay, a, Yeah, Excellent. I feel... I, I feel like my head is much bigger than it was when I walked in. Awesome. So, Fantastic. That's good. Cool, and you perform very, really at the Pocket Theater up in Greenwater. A lot of the Pocket Theater, uh, we're trying to branch out and kind of see you at other theaters can offer and what they can do. And so that's kind of its own exploration itself, you know? Mm -hmm. so, cool. There's lots of small theaters awesome. in Seattle. It's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, there are a lot. It's great. Yeah. A lot of them are in, like, basements, I feel like. You know, there's, like, the Grotto. Mm -hmm. There's the ba Ballard Underground. There's yeah. The or Attics, the Annex. The yeah, Annex, yeah. Uh, lo attic. yeah mm -hmm. Lofted up there. Lofts in basement. No yeah. street-level theaters, <laughs> no, mostly. You know, yeah, they don't want to have people just walk off the street and watch some great theater. Mm -hmm. I work for it. <laughs> yeah. Because space is really cheap in Seattle. The ground-level yeah. space oh, is. yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, how long have you lived in the Seattle area? Ten years this last August. Wow. Happy anniversary. That's right. I celebrated August 28th. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, where were you from before? Um, I have lived in a couple of different places, but I grew up, I was born in Las Vegas, and then we moved around, and then I went back to Las Vegas for the majority of my life, like third grade through high school, and mm -hmm. I moved up here to go to University of Washington. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. What did you study at UW? Uh, chemistry and math. Cool. And uh, those were really exciting. It took me a while to like figure out that that's what I wanted to do, but now I'm an accountant. Which, wow. Yeah, that's a great. Accountant, comedian with a degree <laughs> in chemistry and math. That it's is those, that is a well-rounded education. It's those boring jobs that you like. You do. You have to do like comedy or something because you hate your life, right? Oh, yeah. That's one of those no, I do all of the accounting for all my groups, and so. That's, they like that. Most groups need somebody, somebody to handle to the numbers. Like, oh, yeah. you spent $30 on flyers? Okay, we'll mm -hmm. pay you back. Yeah. Take that out of the good. budget, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how much do you know about local history? Uh, some, I feel like I have like some spots that I'm better at other spots, but not that much. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And you have no idea what we're going to be talking about. No right? idea, and I want to know so bad. Okay, well, let's find out then. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Uh, Francis Elena Farmer. Oh! Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was born September 19th, 1913 in Seattle, Washington. Her father, Ernest, was a lawyer who came to Seattle from Minnesota in 1900. Her mother, Lillian, had a child from a previous marriage, and she grew up as the youngest of four children in their house on Capitol Hill. So this is weird, but I had a dog named Lily and a grandmother named Lillian. Whoa. This is, there's some and weird And her connection. middle name is Elena? Yeah, there's weird. There's a lot of weird name connections. Wow, this might this. be uh, your ancestor here. Well, not, no. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, Ernest was a kind but distant father, and Lillian was an outspoken woman, active in the community. She protested against Seattle's commercial bakeries, claiming their goods were not nutritious enough. She supported feminist causes and became a die-hard anti-communist. She's like the original granola feminist Seattle. She's like what sparked it, I feel like. Yeah. She's, she's like, breads need to be more healthy. Like, can't people just let breads be breads? I thank you. Yeah, exactly. Like, she, this is like the first generation anti gluten. Yeah, why can't I just eat white bread and be completely happy about it? Mm -hmm. You need people telling you that that's not right. Yeah, I don't. I don't want seeds around my crust. I just like I want it to be squishy and have lots of butter on. Yeah, it. Yeah, cheap, mass produced, yeah. just easy Wonder Bread. That's. I mean, it doesn't have to be Wonder Bread. And then you can use the bags for shoes later. It's just <laughs> how that much easy. fiber do people need, right? <laughs> 
Uh, the family moved to a bungalow in West Seattle. Cute. Ernest's law practice wasn't doing well, and the family struggled. Ooh. The couple's marriage started falling apart, and he moved out when Frances was a teenager, but visited regularly, and soon Ernest and Lillian divorced. Poor, poor kid. Yeah. That's, this is a lot like my life. Really? This is really weird. Okay. You know, like the distant father. We're, like, really breaking into who I am. But yeah. Like, Living but in a weird. bungalow. This is, yeah, bungalows. All my life. Okay. In a bungalow. Mm. <laughs> Francis was a gifted child and re- uh, well-read. Very much like me. Yeah, with a knack for performing. Very much like me. Uh, she took voice and piano lessons. <gasps> I play the piano. No way. And at 14, uh, made her stage debut in a church production of The Pirate's Daughter. I'm feeling like this is made up. I'm feeling like you wrote this because I was here and you, like, found out facts about my no, life. No, I, I, I did not. This is a mind. real person, Francis Farmer. Okay, okay. You're, you're skeptical. I am, I am rather skeptical. I'm like, well, and then I was like, how would Chris figure that out about me? Uh, Francis attended West Seattle High, where she joined the debate team. Okay. She wrote, it's not like, not like you. Not didn't, like, you didn't do the mm, debate team? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, she wrote short stories and poetry for the school's literary magazine, worked in the newspaper, played multiple sports, and participated in student government as well as the Honor Society. Overachiever. Yeah, she's doing very well. She is Francie. Her senior year in high school in 1931, she wrote an essay called God Dies. <laughs> I really like her. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I thought you might. I, I thought really, you might. I really, really like her. The essay involved her childhood prayers to God to help her find a missing hat. She was able to find the hat and thanked her prayers. Later, though, a classmate's parent died in an accident. The essay was on the nature of prayer, and if we are to thank God for his intervention in trivial matters, but trust and accept him in the allowance of tragedy, then God was, according to her, quote, useless. I agree with her on so many things. I mean, you know, I didn't know this was going to get religious, but I'm there. You're there? I'm in. You're with her? I'm in. You're with her. Francis, God dies. Yeah, and this is in 1931. That's this is, super controversial. This is, this is scandalous. That's yeah. crazy. And, like, for her to be a young girl, that would, I mean, yeah. that would, like, kind of take you out of the dating pool. Like, she was having some risk right now. She like, was. Yeah, her she friends was. were, like, popping out kids, you know, yeah, all she that was stuff. Yeah, out on a limb there. Uh, her okay. teacher was impressed by the essay and encouraged her to submit it to a writing contest held by The Scholastic, a magazine for high school students. Her essay won first prize, <gasps> $100. Whoa, that's huge back then, right? Yeah, that's a lot what of money. What is that with inflation now? With inflation, uh, maybe thousand, two thousand dollars. That's a lot. It's a big for prize. A girl, for a girl at that time, yeah. to win for a literary contest is like a big deal. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a huge deal. Definitely. Yeah. Newspaper headlines in Seattle reported: Seattle girl denies God and wins prize. <laughs> A minister wrote, quote, if the young people of this city are going to hell, Francis Farmer, Francis Farmer is surely leading them there. Oh, my gosh. Was she, like, it, were they wearing bonnets at this time? They they would not be wearing bonnets. No bonnets? Bonnets would have been much earlier. Much earlier. What or in the, different parts of the oh world. Oh, yeah, because so this is, like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is Seattle in 1931, so there's maybe four okay. or 500,000 people living there. A ballpark in that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's turning into a major city. Yeah, it's still yeah, kind yeah. of an outpost, but it's turning are into a major like, city. Are we pre Gold Rush? Or... Post Gold Rush. Gold, Gold, Gold Rush, Rush was in 1897. So, really post Gold Rush. Wow, I don't know anything about history right now. Really, Sean? <laughs> I just like, I looked up the, the Nordstroms the other day, and apparently I forgot all of that right away. Yeah. But, so, she, so, is this like in the newspaper? I'm just like trying to imagine the picture of her face and like them smearing her name. Yeah, they're, they're, they're besmirching her yeah. in the news. Oh, besmirching. Uh, she would later say of the incident, quote, It was pretty sad because for the first time I found out how stupid people could be. <laughs> it sort of made me feel alone in the world. The more people pointed at me in scorn, the more stubborn I got. And when they began calling me the bad girl of West Seattle High, I tried to live up to it. Nice. What do you do to be, I mean, clearly writing that you deny God as being a bad girl in the 1930s. But like, yes. I mean, are you wearing... Like, do you wear pants if you're a bad girl in the 1930s? She did wear pants. She wore pants. She wore workers' clothes. She slicked her hair back. She was she was kind of tomboyish. Yeah, I get that. It's very much that. reported that she didn't she didn't really and we'll get into that a little bit later. But oh, she okay. didn't really okay. uh, get into the the glamorousness and and well, she wasn't ladylike. She yeah. wasn't she wasn't very ladylike for the time. I love Francis. Farmer enrolled in the University of Washington in September of 1931 as a journalism major before switching to drama. She worked her way through school doing odd jobs, working at a perfume factory, a singing waitress at Mount Rainier's Paradise Lodge, <laughs> posing for art students, and ushering at the Paramount Theater. That's a great resume. Yeah, have. she's very well-rounded. That's a great resume. She's to doing have. a lot of different kinds of yeah. things. 
to work her way through school because her father's law practice isn't doing well. Yeah, and well, has he gone? He's he's already gone. He's like he's visiting. He's there. He's still involved in he's her involved life, in but her she life. doesn't live with him. What did her anymore. mom do? Her mom was a. I, I'm not sure if she had oh, a the gluten, work properly, the but she was she was an activist. She was feminist, diehard anti communist. So she like she's supporting Francis, which is good. She, There's yeah, a she, lot of support for Francis. Francis Farmer is yeah being supported by That's her mother great. and father. That's good. Mm-hmm. She acted in a play called Alien Corn. <laughs> She later wrote... Do you know what that play is about? A little bit, yeah. It's, it? it's about a, a woman... I'll, I'll read this here. I okay. quote, I had a great deal of difficulty separating my own personality from that of the character. I began to sense a dual faculty within me. The prospect of this schizoid condition was fascinating, but it also left me uneasy and frightened. <gasps> so she is like seeing madness and also worried that she has madness. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. She's, uh, she's diving into this, this role, which I believe her role was as a, a school teacher in... The plains, kind of in the middle of nowhere, okay. and kind of losing it a little bit over the course of being isolated and working with children out. Because out of the this... aliens? No and aliens. Unicorn? Aliens. Not not aliens Is like new, aliens from Mars, more aliens corn? like something distant and unfamiliar. Got it. Got it. So unfamiliar corn might be a more relatable... <laughs> unfamiliar. Unfamiliar I'm, corn. Immigrant corn or something like that at the time, maybe? Yes. yes. I don't know. Immigrant corn... I, there's like so much to do with aliens and corn, so I just I thought I thought Martians like crop circles, all right? That oh stuff, yeah, you know? yeah. That, because, that's later. That's crop, later. Crop circles and stuff didn't happen for a while. Those started popping up in England in I think the 1970s. That late? That late? Yeah. Really? The people that started those completely confessed and said we made these crop circles, huh. and everybody said we don't believe you. They're aliens. I think we should do a reprisal of alien corn. I feel like we can find a few I'm sure that'll the, really want to I'm, do that, right? Yeah, I'm sure yeah. you could easily. People do Ibsen over and over again. Why not bring <laughs> back still Alien Corn? See it, yeah. yeah. In March of 1935, she entered into a contest selling subscriptions to a leftist newspaper, The Voice of Action. Friends of hers also sold newspaper subscriptions in her name to help her win a contest they were sponsoring. First prize was a trip to Russia. Farmer won the contest. She was uh, to take a train to New York and then a steamer to Moscow. Whoa. So she's got a bunch of friends and they're all selling this. Yeah, she's like very supported. She She is. She is at the front of a movement. She's doing well. She is. So far, she's doing well. Francis, your future's bright. She was once again at the center of a national controversy. Well, you just said so far she's doing well. Yes. Oh. Foreshadowing. Oh, foreshadowing. Yeah. Oh. Uh, she was once again at the center of a national controversy and denounced publicly by a variety of individuals and organizations, most notably her own mother. Because <gasps> her own mother was a radical anti-communist, and she won oh, this she trip to, to Russia. Russia. Oh, goodness. Lillian Farmer said to the PI, quote, If I must sacrifice my daughter to communism, I hope other mothers save their daughters before they are turned into radicals in our schools. Oh, my gosh. Poor Francis. Poor Francis. I just, I mean, this whole, like, sweep of communism coming through the country, and people are just so afraid of it. So yeah. afraid of it happening. And this is pre-Cold War. No, yeah. Too. In the 50s, things got Way real crazy. worse. But just to hear that somebody is like this, it's, like, so afraid of communists. Denouncing their own daughter. Denouncing their own daughter. Yeah. A group called the American Vigilantes was especially vocal. American Vigilantes was a local group that was very fervently anti-communist. So this wasn't like people dressing up as superheroes and going around and... No, this not wasn't. this isn't Phoenix Jones. <laughs> this wasn't Phoenix Jones, the star, like Phoenix Jones' ancestor was the start Phoenix of Phoenix Jones' great-grandfather? Yeah. What was, like, what would be his... That would be a hell of an origin story. That would be, yeah. Maybe, well, and maybe he's like, maybe it's still the same original Phoenix Jones, and that's like one of his superpowers that we don't know about. Oh, he just, he's we eternally just, young and strong? Yeah, and... we just think he's like this normal guy because he doesn't have anything else I don't think anybody thinks he's a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's a fair point. But what if like that's his only superpower is that he can like, he can live as long as nobody kills him. Like he just goes on living. Okay. But he doesn't have he's anything. He's immortal but not invulnerable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he is like not super strong or smart or anything else that's your only superpower maybe that's phoenix jones <laughs> yeah uh, amongst the ranks of the american vigilantes was a man named john a freighter okay francis farmer claimed she was not a communist and had no interest in politics but was merely taking advantage of the opportunity to go to russia and study russian theater 
Oh. So she went to Russia in 1935, and upon returning, she did not come back to Seattle. But when she got to New York, she exchanged her return train ticket for $25 and stayed in New York. I don't blame her. No. That gluten, gluten-free <laughs> mom at home, like, that's, I wouldn't want to be here either. Within the span of a few weeks, she got an agent, made contact with casting directors, and signed a contract with Paramount Pictures. Why has nobody made this into a movie? Like, this is the classic, like, small town girl at the time. Mm-hmm. Small town girl goes to New York and, the, and Russia and then comes back and then is like, gets an agent right away. Has been made into a movie. This has been made this into a movie. This has been made into a movie. Okay, we'll worry about that. Okay, we'll worry about that. Okay, we'll worry about that. Yeah, several books, movie. Lots of, lots of, of, there's, a lot has been written about this. Is it coyote? I think it's largely been. Is it coyote ugly? It's coyote ugly. Is that what it is? <laughs> it turns into coyote ugly, that's what happens? Yeah, she gets a job dancing on a bar and, oh. yeah. Uh, no, not coyote ugly. Uh, Dare to dream. But she's, she's doing really well, automatically, and this is in the she's 1930s. Immediately gets signed, Paramount Pictures signs her, immediately gets an agent, starts doing well. Right off the bat. Wow. It should also be noted that she's she's gorgeous. She's very talented. She's very beautiful. She so was they're like just hiding saying, behind those tomboy that tomboyish right. fashion and it, oh. Paramount immediately sent her to Hollywood, where she was a contract player making one hundred dollars per week. Working with a voice and movement coach, uh, she took publicity photos and underwent many makeovers. They attempted to get her to change her name, but she resisted, also refusing to wear glamorous clothes on her own time. Wouldn't Ugh. wear glamorous clothes, wouldn't wear makeup. She's who I want to be if I live in the 1930s. <laughs> yeah. That is, I mean, I guess she's kind of who I want to be now. Mm-hmm. In the... Making movies and being who you are. Yeah, and just like, fuck you, mom, with your non-gluten. I don't know. My mom eats a lot of gluten, so I can't relate to that. I was trying mm-hmm. to. I was trying to get there, and I just couldn't mm-hmm. do it. She couldn't do it. No, but when you do alien corn, you're going to have to You're gonna have to oh, dive into that a little bit alien more. alien corn. She was very open about her attitude that film was not where she wanted to be and hoped to make it to the quote-unquote legitimate theater soon. She's like, she's just not happy. She's just not happy with that. It's not enough for her. It's not. No, she wants more. She wants more. She's ambitious. In 1936, she married actor Wycliffe Anderson, who had no such reservations about changing his name. (laughs) He changed it to William Anderson, then Glenn Erickson, finally landing on Leif Erickson. The marriage lasted only one year. She later wrote, quote, I did not go into the union with any dewy-eyed hopes or illusions, and in my mind I was still Francis Farmer, not Mrs. William Anderson, and certainly not Mrs. Leif Erickson. He was just like a more permanent fling, I feel like. I mean, she's got so much going on for her. Why would I, like, sow your seeds, you know? Or yeah, have why your settle seeds down? <laughs> Is that like is that the female comparative of sowing your sowing seeds? your wild oats? Sowing your wild oats, or you're like, are my wild oats sown? Yeah. Is that what happens? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. She's not to... not looking to settle down right now. She no, yeah, no. She's she's got stuff to do. She's got the world to conquer still. Yeah. Her first year in Hollywood, she made four movies, including Rhythm on the Rage with Bing Crosby. Her most notable film was Come and Get It, where she played two parts, one of a mother and the other of a daughter, which was a commercial and critical success. She played her mother, she played the mother to her daughter. A mother and a daughter. She played two characters. Not to herself, like not the mother to her daughter. I believe it was the mother to, she played both characters at different time periods. (laughs) But she played two characters, a mother and a daughter. I get what you Mm -hmm. mean, like through time. Isn't Bing Crosby from up here? Bing Crosby? I don't know. I, I I don't know much about him, to tell you the I truth. I thought that he was, like, from up here, and I thought that he has kind of, like, a... He has, like, a nifty pearls with women, how he treats women. Is that weird? Is that wrong? Oh, that he was he had some abusive yeah, tendencies? I, 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 I don't. I vaguely recall hearing stuff about that now, but I've not done any research, and I, I'm, I didn't, I've not heard that he's from around here. Or he lived here at some point? I don't know why. I feel like... That wouldn't surprise me. None of that would surprise me. I feel like I've heard that. And it was like, oh, is that going to taint my Christmas holiday? Knowing that Bing Crosby Knowing that beat they... women? Yeah. And it didn't. So. It, it did not? Okay. <laughs> I still... <laughs> I still whistle along with those tunes, so... Okay. Yeah. Well, you've been able to move past it. Yeah. Like... Oh, God. Well, papers hailed her as the next Greta Garbo. Ooh. She was getting great reviews. She returned to Seattle for the premiere of the movie and received a hero's welcome, including the governor holding a reception for her at the Olympic Hotel. Whoa. Olympic Hotel downtown. That's a big deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, which movie is this? Is this the mother and daughter this movie? This is Come and Get It. This is the mother-daughter movie. The mother-daughter This is the one movie. where she's being hailed as the next Greta Garbo. Jeez Louise. So she's doing real well. She's, like, fast-tracking it. 
She returned to Hollywood and made more movies, but she was starting to get a reputation as a temp- as temperamental and difficult to work with. Well, you know, when people aren't as talented as you are and you're, like, working with them, it's really hard to get things done. <laughs> Did you have that problem a lot? Yeah. And you're like, we spent $30 on flyers. How do you not know this? <laughs> How do you not know this? I spent $30 on Friday flyers. How do you not know this? You mm-hmm. know, most of the time it's like that. She refused to wear glamorous clothes or wear makeup when she wasn't working, and she was willful and seemed to be a tomboy. Not ideal for the studio was trying to sell her as a glamorous movie star. Yeah. She managed to break her contract with Paramount to travel to New York to work in theater. She played the lead in the group theater's production of Clifford Odette's Golden Boy, and it was the big- biggest success the theater group had ever had. Whoa. Farmer was 24 years old. Sorry for not saying anything right there. My face was in a state of shock. Yes. Because <laughs> she Woody. is crushing it. She's, oh, yeah. Crushing it so at 24. Much. So much fucking talent. She had an affair with Odette's, the playwright. Which ended when he sent her a note that said, quote, My wife returns from Europe today, and I feel it best for us never to see each other again. I feel like she was like, whatever. Moved on. No, like, she didn't. Oh, Odette's was it. Yeah, Odette's she, was guy. she started, she got, she got upset by that. In 1938, she was sued by her former agent, who had initially arranged the screen text with her for Paramount. He sued her for $75,000 in management fees. Whoa. She won the court case, but these troubles bothered her a great deal, and she started drinking heavily. At 24. Mm-hmm. She was dropped from the production of Golden Boy when it went to tour Europe. She starred in two other stage productions, but they both bombed. She was cast in a third, but she was replaced before opening <gasps> night. Replaced by who? Do you know that? A different actress. I don't know oh. who, who, who specifically rep- re- replaced her. Oh. Frances Farmer returned to Hollywood and say, made six more films, but they were low-budget and not successful. In early 1942... <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just like, oh, I had to go back to film. Yeah. You know, like, as somebody that's, like, performing and doing that kind of stuff, you know, oh, I would get to do film. I would love to be I in a Hollywood movie. And she's like, oh, I gotta go back to film. I gotta go back to oh, making gee. movies. I gotta go back to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. But the movies she's making now aren't aren't doing so well. Yeah. In early 1942, she became dependent on amphetamines and continued drinking heavily. Benzedrine, at the time, was easily available and often recommended by doctors as an appetite present for women looking to lose weight. Oh, my gosh. It was a big problem back then. That is then. a big problem. I mean, well, we have we still have that, like, sometimes happening. Like, Fenfen was recent. I mean, and that was, you know, like a, I don't know, 10, ten years ago? Fenfen? Yeah. Isn't that longer than that? I thought that was, like, 30 years ago. I feel like that's been in my time period, and I'm not 30 yet, so. Okay. But... I don't know. Yeah, it was very common for doctors to say, oh, you want to lose some weight? Here, I'm going to write you a prescription for Benzedrine. Yeah. Have well, some, I mean, take some Benzedrine. I mean, they used to give housewives morphine because they were like, you can't handle your day. Yes. Have some morphine. Mm-hmm. In Oct- on October 19th, 1942, she was heavily intoxicated and pulled over for driving with her brights on in a dim-out zone. What's a dim-out zone? Dim-out zone during World War II, they would have dim-out times, dim-out zones, where you, you basically had a blackout over the city. Where oh, they would to, like, cut out the lights. Energy. Not to save energy, more so you wouldn't be visible to bombers. Oh! So you weren't supposed to have your light, you're supposed to essentially drive without your lights on or not drive at all. <laughs> safe! That Which sounds really safe! It doesn't seem very safe. Really safe. Yeah, maybe you weren't even supposed you to drive at bomb, all. You won't be bombed, but you could crash your car into something. But dim out z- zones were no lights. You could not have lights. And so is it a just lot of... the cars, or is it like the whole city? It's the whole like city. Dim-out. It's dim-out. the whole city. Whole large sections of the city. Because they didn't want them to be able to identify buildings and land features and things for bombings. It should have probably been like a no drive at the same time as a no dim out. Like, yeah. Don't just like, oh, don't just drive with your lights off. Just don't drive. It should have been, stay at home, turn your lights off. Yeah. Walk. If you gotta go walk. If you gotta go walk. Walk somewhere. Yeah, well, she's driving in this dim out zone. And she was arrested for drunk driving and failure to obey the dim-out restrictions. Also apparently telling the officer, quote, you bore me. <laughs> she was fined $250, which she paid half of, promising to pay the other half later, and sentenced to a suspended 180-day jail sentence. <laughs> I would love to be a, I promise I'll pay it later. Yeah. You don't get a, you, where's the line to write that on the back of a ticket these days? I think you can, you can do that if you, if you have like financial difficulty. Like a payment you, plan. Yeah, payment plan. Payment plan. Mm-hmm. I have this, like, fantasy where she's just like, oh, I'll do that. I'll I think this might be more like Scout's Honor. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay you back later. No problem. Drunk in the courtroom. Well, in court, she was belligerent. You are absolutely correct. <laughs> so uh, she went to a movie to, in Mexico, to film in Mexico, uh, but quit after two weeks. 
January 1943, she was cast in a drama called No Escape. On the first day, she slapped a hairdresser so hard, the woman was knocked to the ground and dislocated her jaw. Oh! When the hairdresser went to the police, it was found Farmer already had a warrant out for failure to pay her ha- other half of the drunk driving fine. That $125 is coming back to Hawthorne. It really is. <laughs> yes. In court, she was belligerent. When the judge asked her if she had been drinking, she said, yes, I drank everything I could get, including Benzedrine. <laughs> she was sentenced to 180 days. The suspended sentence from before was oh, no okay. longer suspended. They said, you're doing that 180 days. When she heard the sentence, she knocked an officer to the floor and attacked two others, yelling, quote, have you ever had a broken heart? Oh, so Odette's. We're back. Like this. I feel like this stems from Odette's, right? You think this is That's still back from thinking. Odette's? I feel like this stems from Odette's. I feel like we can blame this on Odette's. Because that's what I would be doing. That's what you'd be doing? Yeah, I'd be like, it's Odette's. No, I wouldn't. But, I mean, it's funny that it was the movie that she was filming was No Escape that landed her in jail, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, irony. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Her mother blamed her daughter's behavior on consistently being cast as a professional harlot in motion pictures. Later, she would blame her daughter's, daughter's troubles on communism. Oh, back to communism. Back to communism. Back to communism. I feel like Lillian's not the kind of person you want to invite to Thanksgiving dinner. Probably not. Or any kind of dinner. No, probably. She, she doesn't want gluten, she doesn't, she doesn't want communism, and she yeah. doesn't want harlots. Yeah. So what kind of a Thanksgiving are you going to have? She's like, is this pharaoh? I only eat pharaoh. That's a grain, right? Or something? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's yeah. a grain. Yeah. After serving one night of her jail sentence... A psychiatrist hired by her family was able to transfer her to the psychiatric ward of the Los Angeles General Hospital for a few days before she was committed to Rock Haven Sanitarium, also known as the Screen Actors Sanitarium. So how old is she at this point? At this point, let's see here. It's 1943 at this point, and she was born in 1913, so that would make her 30. 30. 30. She's uh, about to turn 30, I believe. Well, I have like two yeah. years then to get committed to a sanitarium to really fulfill my life goal of being Francis Farmer. Okay. Gotta work. I actually get to work on that now. Right? I, I would focus more on the first half of her <laughs> life than on the no, second no, no, no. half. It's, I feel like it's much easier to do the sanitarium than to get in a movie at this point. I'm, right? sure, I'm sure it would be easier to get committed than it yeah. is to land in a big budget Hollywood movie. I can commit myself. So. I've not been able to achieve either of those goals so far <laughs> in my life. We both have. We both are looking after Francis. We re- I feel yeah. like right now. Uh, she was released after seven months and diagnosed with depression, manic depressive psychosis, split personality, and schizophrenia with paranoid delusions. One of the methods of treatment they gave her was insulin shock, where the patient would be injected with an overdose of insulin to induce con- convulsions and coma, thinking the shock might the shock might have a benefit to them. Who makes up these? I mean, when you hear about like how they used to treat mental disorders, mental health. Treatment at the time was horrible. In the this is dark, the dark ages. ages. The dark yeah. ages. But who? I mean, I think about that first doctor who was like, "Well, I saw one time that I accidentally, you know, somebody got too much insulin. There had to be a point where somebody got too much insulin, right? right? And then he was like, that might have helped their mental state. A shock to their system to knock knock it out, yeah. knock things back into place. Yeah. yeah, just horrible. So obviously, the mental health treatment she's getting is doing much more harm than good. Yeah. Upon her release in 1943, she returned to Seattle to live with her mother. She was remanded to her mother's custody. Worse than the sanitarium. Yeah, the two fought constantly. March of 1944, Lillian Farmer filed a complaint in the courts requesting her daughter be diagnosed as an insane person and be committed to Harborview on the grounds that she refused to work, had become depressed, and was showing signs of violence. Is that because you couldn't get committed as a communist? I feel like... I feel like that's what really Lillian Farmer is really saying. It's, like, it's, you know, it's probably like all tied together. Reading through between the lines. Yeah. Uh, well, Lillian said her, uh, da- her daughter had, quote, turned the radio up loudly, <laughs> which I knew would annoy the neighbors. I asked her to turn it down, and she became quite ang- angry, grabbed my wrist, and pushed me into a chair. She is a fighter. She's a fighter. And she's strong. She's Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. like, ooh. Three hospital attendants arrived in the home on March 21st, and dragged Frances, kicking and screaming, put her in a straitjacket, and took her to Harborview. Two days later, her sanity hearing was held. The hearing was under the supervision of doctors Don Nicholson and George Price. The two doctors concluded that, quote, marital difficulty is said to be pre, uh, predisposing cause of insanity. She was deemed to be suffering from schizophrenia. They recommended to the King County Superior Court judge that Frances Farmer be committed to the Western State Hospital Mental Asi- Asylum in Stalicum. Her court-appointed guardian waived her right to an attorney. <laughs> That's great. 
Yeah, but the judge presiding over the matter was John A. Frater, the member of the American Vigilantes, oh, who had condemned Farmer back. years prior on the grounds that she was a communist. Oh, great. He had personally selected Dr. Don Nicholson as one of the psychiatrists overseeing the hearing. Dr. Nicholson had already committed thousands to the state asylum, believed he could gauge sanity on a few simple questions, and thought all communists were subs- suspect of being insane. So... So basically, we're just committing communists for uh, yeah <laughs> right now. And well, he was accused of committing individuals who were not mentally ill but simply undesirable to society. Oh, great! Okay. So he's <laughs> he he has dubious a dubious record yeah. of committing people. Yeah. Just I I do you have what the questions are. Do you know what the questions I don't. Are? I'm, I'm guessing it's something along the lines of Are you a communist? Yes. Well, then you're do, you're going to do you like the color red? Uh, yes. Do you drink tea? I don't know what else they would answer. That would just yeah. be like silly questions. If I, I've shown you this picture of a hammer and sickle. What do you see here? <laughs> a hammer and sickle. Communist! Communist! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frances Farmer was sent to be committed to Western State Hospital. She was immediately put on a regiment of electroconvulsive therapy two to three times a week for three months. You know that they still do ECT yeah. as a thing? Mm-hmm. That's, that kind of boggles my mind, that they still... I mean, it, it's effective. It can be. It can, it can be. Can be for but like, it also can be incredibly detrimental. Well, it gets it's rid one of those... your memories, basically, kind of, right? It's I, supposed to destroy. I read a book a while ago called Electro Boy about an art dealer who in New York who went insane, and uh-huh. he received electroshock treatment, and he credits it with saving his life. It was he said it was the only thing that that ever worked in his years of seeking treatment in other ways. Well, my this is. Sorry. But this this is probably, Frances Farmer yeah. is probably not going to be benefiting much from it. No. I mean, because the girl is just, like, sad and a little manic. And she just, she probably just needs a hug. Yeah. She needs a GD hug from Lillian and to not be called a communist for just maybe, yes. like, five seconds. Maybe, in her life. yeah. Yeah, she probably has some kind of, of psychiatric problems, but... It's not, this isn't making it better. This yeah. is, everything that's happening to her is making it much worse. much worse. It's also widely speculated that she was a lesbian or bisexual. And that that, it, there's no, not really much documentation. Well, at time, but at the time, that would in, be incredibly she would be difficult undesirable. to fit in. And yeah. yeah, she would be an undesirable element in yeah. society. And that would contribute to her inability to adapt to societal norms. Oh, yeah. And, and like now, if she had come out, we would have been like, oh, I saw that coming. Right. Yeah. The way she'd been living her life. <laughs> After three months, her doctors were convinced she made a complete recovery, and she was released into her mother's custody. God, back to Lillian. Well, she fled. Good. And lived with an aunt in Nevada for a few months. She was arrested for vagrancy in Antioch, California, while attempting to find work picking fruit. What is vagrancy? What does that mean? Vagrancy, loitering. So you're just, you're just it's somewhere for too long that somebody doesn't want you to be I think that's what happened. That's what's going on? Yeah, she's sleeping on the streets. <laughs> so she was, she was picking fruit. She got arrested for like she, a migrant worker. Being, yeah. Yeah, basically doing that. that be, job. Being a vagrant. Being a vagrant. Yeah. She was released into the custody of her mother. God. Who in less than a month had her recommitted to Western State Hospital. Ugh. The facility was designed to hold 200 patients. At the time Frances Farmer was there, it housed over 2,700 Oh. Too many. Way too many. It was grossly understaffed, and often patients were forced to stay in the bed for 12 hours at a time. Like trapped down. Strapped to bed, right? because they couldn't, they didn't have enough staff to oversee, so they would Not just say, just room. stay in bed, we'll yeah. tie you to the bed. Just tied up in bunk beds. Yeah. It make, I don't know why, but that makes me think of like the Matrix. Where they're all oh, everybody's stacked up? <laughs> stacked up. That doesn't, that's a jump. That's a jump. <laughs> Since 1936, a new procedure for treating the mentally ill had been gaining popularity. Lobotomy. Oh, here we go. Dr. Walter J. Freeman was the pioneer of lobotomy and personally performed thousands over the course of his career. Of course he did. It is certain that Dr. Walter J. Freeman visited Western State Hospital at the time that Francis Farmer was a patient there. He performed at least 13 lobotomies there, but it is unclear whether or not she received the treatment. What? Unclear? Unclear. Well, Farmer, her friends, family, and three nurses, all working at the hospital, claim that she did not. Okay. Freeman claims he lobotomized her. Oh, so Freeman's like... Freeman is saying, Freeman... I performed the surgery on Francis Farmer, 
And a bunch of other people Everybody are saying, saying no. no, that didn't happen. He claimed that not only he performed the procedure on her, but that the most famous picture of him performing a lobotomy surrounded by nurses and doctors demonstrating the technique that she was the patient. So if you do a Google image search for lobotomies, one okay. of the first things that pop up is it's a famous picture. You've probably seen it before. Yeah, I feel um, like. Of a, a, a guy lobotomizing someone, and they're surrounded by doctors and nurses, and he's saying, that's Frances Farmer on the table. And she's covered up. You wouldn't be able to yeah. tell if you it's wouldn't her really or not. Tell. Of course you wouldn't really be able to tell. Right. I feel like there's a little something going on, like, the mom and the, the doctor. There is, like... They're in cahoots? Yeah, some kind of co- collusion, if you will. Maybe. I will. Yeah, like some love or some something. Maybe Francis is like an illegitimate child. I don't know. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm trying to like put more scandal in. Well, yeah. This is like clearly already scandalous. Enough. There's, there's a lot like, of scandal going on in this story. How could it be more scandalous? Well, Farmer was released on March 23rd, 1950 after a five-year stint in the asylum. Please tell me not back to Lillian. She, was re- she remained under the supervision of her mother. Oh, until, God. Until 1953, when she successfully petitioned the court for full restoration of her rights. Thank goodness. So she got her rights back. She's she's independent again. She left her parents' home and got a job at the Olympic Hotel, folding laundry. Oh. The same place that the governor had a reception for her years ago. Now she's working there folding laundry. Oh, God. She married again. Six months later, she left her husband and bought a one-way ticket to Eureka, California, because it was the farthest she could get away from Seattle with what little money she had. That's... The train station said, how far can I get with this? And Eureka. Eureka, that's a, California. That's a... When you get that answer, it's not a good answer. But if when you're her, you're trying to get out of here. It doesn't really matter. Yep. Yeah. She never saw her parents again. Good. She made several comeback attempts, working on stage and in some TV shows. She went on Ed Sullivan and TV dramas. She married a third time, and this one didn't last long either. She was offered a job in Indianapolis hosting her own TV show called Francis Farmer Presents, where she introduced movies and interviewed celebrities. She was successful through it for a time, but then her health began to deteriorate, and her behavior once again became erratic. I wonder why her health began to deteriorate. Why do you think? Well, like, all of the shit they've done to her. Like, the ECT and the insulin shots and all of that stuff. and. One of her co-workers wrote, quote, All of a sudden, on certain days, and for whatever reason, Francis was talking like a truck driver. This <laughs> lovely, charming, elegant, sensitive lady would chew out the program director or someone, then go storming out the back door, pop in her Edsel, and go flying out of the parking lot. What's an Edsel? Edsel? Old car? It's just like a... It's a, a pretty... It's a shitty car from the 1950s. Oh, okay. <laughs> Edsel was a lemon. It was a notorious lemon. Got it. Got back it. Got in the it, day. Got it. She was fired, rehired and fired again, and arrested several more times for drunk driving. She died August 1st, 1970, of esophageal cancer at the age of 57. Oh, Francis. Uh, Several books were written about her, most notably Shadowlands. A movie was made about the story of her life. And in 1993, Nirvana released a song called Francis Farmer Will Have Her Revenge on Seattle on their their album In Utero. No way! Well, and then... Uh, didn't Kurt name his daughter Francis? He did. I'm I'm not sure if he named her after yeah, I don't know if after Francis Farmer. For that, yeah, her name is like Francis Bean or whatever. Francis Bean Cobain. Yeah, yeah. But what a sad, what a sad story. Right? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. I want to know more about like. I feel like there's something more with the mom. There has to be something more with the mom, right? Yeah, she probably had her own mental issues going on but because her fervent her her, her is manifested in this anti-communist paranoia that's what happens when you don't eat gluten you have <laughs> anti-communist paranoia well because her, her paranoia herself. was manifesting itself in a way that was more in line with what's acceptable to society at the time the time yeah she's not going to be diagnosed no, she's not going to be but she probably had some issues going on not at all what was I mean, the clearly. movie that was made about? I believe it was called Shadowlands. I forgot. I don't have oh, it in my okay. notes here, but I believe it was it was the movie based on the book. And the oh. book reports the the book Shadowlands reports that she was lobotomized. It was a book written by PI investigators. Oh. She had a a, a quote unquote autobiography that was released, but mm-hmm. it what she was work she was writing on it, and then a friend of hers finished it, and the friend spent two years reworking it, and then it was released two years after she died. Got it. So it's speculated that it's not entirely accurate as to what her her own perspective on her life. 
that makes sense to me that she has probably been through all of that. And I feel like she was ha- she had some mental stuff going on. Mm-hmm. We can't deny that. Yes. There was something happening there. So And everything was made much worse by the treatment that they were <laughs> yeah. they were giving her. Yeah, 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 yeah. But some of it I bet is, you know, was a little fantastic, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Just lobotomies. lobotomies. Insulin shock. The whole Insulin shock sounds like the worst. The uh what was it? Convulsions. Like Making convulsions. Insulin happen. convulsions? Yeah. 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 That, oh, this is, yeah. This yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. And her, since she was, you know, willful and non I was and so non- excited conformist. at the beginning of the story about my involvement and my similarities. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm worried for myself. Because you feel like you're going down the same path? Yeah. Now I've, it's, I will. You know how to avoid that, right? Not get in a movie. Eat gluten. Eat gluten. To bread. I'm going to go get a loaf of bread. Do you have bread here now? I do have Let's bread, eat bread here now. now. Okay. Let's that's... eat bread now. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to The Seattle Files. Thank you so much, Elena Martinez, thank for you. being here. Uh, if you have a topic suggestion that you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook. Be sure to subscribe and rate in iTunes. New episodes come out every Tuesday, so check back next Tuesday. I'll be back with a new topic, a new guest, and a new episode. Thanks for listening. Episode. Thanks for listening. Episode. Thanks for listening. Episode. Thanks for listening. Episode. Thanks for listening.